we did start now. <laughs> yeah, we've just started the webinar so the attendees will begin to join. Yeah, I did it. Oh yeah, I could see audience coming in. Um, hi everyone, let's wait for like a couple of minutes. No, just one minute, <laughs> sorry, um, for more audience. Okay, um, I think we can start now. Um, okay, and now is it okay to start? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Okay, um, so yes, good, good afternoon um, from Bangkok and also from the Mekong region and um, welcome you all to the first Our Mekong, I would say webinar series um, titled Powering the Mekong, that's clean energy means more dams. And my name is Palita Wangkiet. Um, I'm a Mekong project officer for the Instant News uh, Journalism Network uh, or EJN. And I'm also editor for Mekong Eye and I will be the moderator today. Um, before we start, um, let me give you a bit of detail about um, this webinar. So um, this webinar is part of the webinar series on the Mekong National Resource Governance uh, led by EJN and funded by the USAID Mekong for the Future through the Worldwide Fund for Nature or WWF. So our organization EJN um, focus on building journalist capacity to report on the environment, um, especially in developing countries. Um, so this webinar is part of our activities that aim to increase journalists and the public access to information about the environmental issues. And we will have four webinars under our Mekong, our say series throughout this year to discuss more about the national resources in the Mekong region. And um, before we dive deep into the webinar, I want to announce that we have Thai and Khmer simultaneous interpretations throughout the event. So you can switch to Thai or Khmer channel by clicking on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. And those wishing to listen in English can just stay at the original audio channel where we are now. Um, so let's get back to the webinar. Um, so today we will focus on the Mekong Energy Outlook um, and the role of the region and local organizations in contributing to the energy transition and also the role of dams in this energy outlook. So the idea comes from our observation of the ongoing global energy crisis. So last year we saw Vietnam experience occasional backouts because of the energy shortage. We also saw the policy maker in Thailand talking more about alternative energy sources um, after the hike of national gas prices. And, and actually one of the main alternatives um, for Vietnam, Thailand, and also Cambodia is to export energy from hydropower in dams, so from hydropower dams in Laos. So we will try to understand this situation to our four speaker who are expert on energy and national resource governance and see what this situation means um, for the Mekong regions and its people. Um, so yeah, let's now turn to the speakers. Um, so today we have four speakers. So we have um, Rafael Guawala Senga, Manager Energy Lead for Greater Mekong Subregion at the WWF. Um, Carl Middleton, um, Director at Center for Social Development Studies at Jularongon University. And also Paul Kun Ut, Engagement Program Manager at Energy Lab Cambodia. Um, and Stefan Bosner, Research Fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute, or uh, SEI. And I also want to add this, um, that um, thank you WWF and SEI for helping us connecting with the speaker who are quite busy with their work, but are really kind to spend their time with us today. 
Um, so the way we will facilitate this webinar is that we will ask each speaker to go to the main point um, for around 12 minutes and followed by a brief um, five minute Q&A section. And then we can got back to like the final Q&A section to collect all remaining questions from the audience. So for those who want to ask anything to speak, uh, um, please stop your questions in Q&A box um, by clicking on Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And we will collect your questions and ask speakers for live answers. Okay, so um, I think that's all for me. Um, so now it's time to start. So um, let's start with um, Love um, from the WWF. Um, so Love, um, you have been working on the Mekong climate and energy policy, also involved with um, developing campaigns for renewables. Um, I think you also co wrote a piece about how we can move forward with energy transi transition without jeopardizing the river. So um, where the Mekong countries are at now in terms of energy landscape and how can you know, this region contribute to the energy transition well with or without dams? Um, so the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tarita. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yep, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So uh, what WWF and our uh, COO, CSO partners here in the Greater Mekong are trying to do is uh, uh, to optimize uh, grid expansion here to build a green and inclusive power sector in the greater Mekong subregion. So uh, our main thesis is basically a, a smartly designed and institutionalized GMS regional power grid and cross-border trade can facilitate the transition to 100% renewable, renewable electricity without sacrificing our precious rivers. So that's our main thesis uh, for the uh, study that uh, we are going to launch pretty soon uh, together with our CSO partners. Uh, and we have two main tracks basically uh, to do that. One is uh, through this uh, uh, dissemination of uh, the report uh, findings and recommendations, and also to uh, work with our uh, CSO partners uh, at the Energy Innovation Network. Uh, to uh, advocate for a greener and a cleaner uh, power sector uh, in the greater Mekong without sacrificing our rivers. So uh, here is a brief uh, uh, overview of uh, how uh, electricity demand uh, is projected to grow uh, in the greater Mekong. You can see that it's a uh, it's one of the fast, it will be one of the fastest growing uh, electricity markets uh, in the world. Um, and demand is expected to triple by 2050. And you can see which countries uh, will play a very significant role in, in terms of demand, uh, electricity demand in the future. By 2035, Vietnam is projected to basically consume 50%. Uh, of uh, electricity in the in the Mekong region, and this is the current uh, electricity mix uh, in the region. Uh, it's dominated by fossil fuel, uh, mainly uh, natural gas and coal, and of course hydropower. Uh, there is a, a substantial uh, development of uh, deployment of solar uh, in a number of countries, including Vietnam, Thailand, and uh, over the recent years, uh, over the last four years or so in Cambodia. And we all know that uh, the region, aside from hydropower, has vast solar and wind energy resources. And this came from uh, NREL, uh, with, with whom we are working right now. Actually, uh, they're giving uh, uh, training uh, to our CSO partners uh, in, the, in the regional network. 
So this is uh, how it looks today. And this is what we envision for uh, the future. We believe that there is enough uh, renewable energy resources apart from hydropower that can uh, pro uh, supply 100% electricity by 2050 or even earlier. So it's primarily solar and wind and a very minimal uh, uh, increase uh, in hydropower. And I will talk more about that later. And uh, you can see that uh, we can actually phase out, completely phase out fossil fuel by uh, 2050. And how do we do that? So we, we have four scenarios. So I'm not showing the business as usual scenario. Uh, just focus on the, the, right, uh, the right most uh, uh, schematic diagram. This is renewable energy. Uh, optimization with grid expansion directed or dedicated towards identified renewable energy zones, variable renewable energy zones, I must emphasize, because uh, uh, the current uh, grid uh, uh, development plan uh, is mainly focused still on conventional energy sources like thermal energy and hydropower. Uh, but we believe that if we can actually direct grid expansion towards this uh, solar and wind uh, uh, energy zones, uh, we can actually facilitate a, a more uh, accelerated transition towards uh, zero carbon electricity. And this is a, another important graph uh, that shows us that uh, the cost of producing electricity or capex, uh, not, not producing electricity, sorry, the capex cost of uh, the different technologies, conventional uh, sources will basically remain uh, the same. It won't change. Uh, it, it will change very little, but you, will, you can see the steep cost decline of solar, wind, and even, in the, even battery storage. And uh, this is another graph that uh, shows us that we don't have to pay a higher price for electricity by transitioning to sustainable renewable electricity. You see here that uh, the most uh, ambitious uh, scenario, the green one, the renewable energy with the uh, dedicated grid expansion uh, to the renewable energy zones actually uh, will yield a lower cost, a le lower levelized cost of energy for the consumers. And even without grid expansion, if we focus on solar and wind, it will still be cheaper than the base scenario dominated by fossil fuel, uh, natural gas, and coal. And obviously, uh, if we move towards a 100% renewable energy supply, uh, we will have zero emission, near zero emission from the power sector. And uh, to end, uh, to summarize my presentation, these are the benefits of uh, uh, regional grid in, uh, integration. Uh, I have to emphasize that uh, we want, uh, we are looking forward to an institutionalized and well-designed uh, regional grid interconnection because it can facilitate a more efficient utilization of the vast RE resources of the greater Mecca including the underutilized solar and wind resources in the region. We have bar barely touched the surface, basically, of uh, what we have here in the Mekong in terms of, of solar and wind. And then the second is uh, it, will it, it can facilitate a more stable regional grid. Uh, Enel is here with us, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, uh, our civil society partners understand better how an integrated regional grid can actually make uh, even the national grid more stable and provide a more resilient uh, source of electricity. Uh, because uh, a more dispersed uh, uh, renewable energy zones uh, from solar and wind can actually make it a more stable grid. 
And then, it, it will, uh, as I mentioned, it will pave the way for the lower cost of electricity in the region, um, the carbonization of the power sector. And um, another very important point is it will save our most important rivers by changing the role of existing hydropower from what is normally uh, uh, used as base load source of electricity, which is that the most efficient uh, uh, use of hydropower, as we know. Uh, it can actually play a role in uh, acceler accelerating the deployment of solar and wind. Mean, I mean, the existing ones. And the second point is, uh, we, we think that uh, we should consider developing well-sited pump storage hydropower instead. Uh, well cited uh, is a very important uh, qualifier because pump storage hydropower located in ecologically sensitive areas will also result into ecological impacts, ecological and social impacts. And uh, we would like to believe that uh, uh, the greater Mekong uh, integrated uh, power grid can be the starting point of an ASEAN, ASEAN grid that has been envisioned by uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation for, I think, almost 10 years now. It was uh, form formerly called the ASEAN Super Grid. And we actually have uh, a representative of the ASEAN Center for Energy here uh, in, the work in the workshop. So it, it's really, it will be a, an interesting uh, discussion tomorrow in the panel. And the last point I would like to emphasize is uh, uh, we are pushing for possibilities for multi-actor approaches uh, on power sector de development. Because in the region, it's uh, in most countries, in almost all countries, the power sector is uh, controlled by uh, state-owned uh, utilities. Uh, and these are monopolies. So, and um, very little consultation is uh, happening right now and participation and engagement uh, by civil society. And what we are doing right now is, uh, so last year uh, we, we had our first uh, civil, regional civil society workshop in Bangkok. Uh, we organized uh, the Energy Innovation Network and we started building the technical and policy uh, capacity of uh, the EIN uh, through uh, the fundamentals of power systems uh, course uh, last year. And then uh, as I'm speaking, uh, our NREL colleagues are, are, are pro providing the second and more advanced uh, part of our uh, training to our CSO uh, colleagues. And we are focusing on the integration of viable renewable energy, primarily solar and wind, into the into a well-designed and institutionalized uh, regional power grid for the Greater Mekong, and uh, we can only do that if civil society capacity is built so that meaningful meaningful engagement with decision makers in government and the private sector will be meaningful and uh, and more more effective i guess uh, i'll stop there and i'll i'll be happy to answer questions thank you laf um, and thanks for keeping your time um like before we go into the question let me alert the thai interpreter um you have to Unmute yourself first um, because um, the, the Thai channel couldn't be heard by the audience. Um, yeah, um, get back to Love. Love, um, thank you very much. Um, and good to hear that we could have like the bottom up process, you know, to make um, clean energy works um, in bigger scale. So um, there are some questions in the QA box um, that I could ask you now. So um, one question from Yin Li. Um, she, 
So the question is that for the fully integrated regional grid, are there examples from other regions like what work and what did not work? Ah uh, yes, uh, uh, there are uh, a number of examples of a fully integrated uh, regional grid. Uh, uh, the best one is the existing uh, uh, European uh, power grid, uh, which works uh, as a single uh, system um, and it has the, uh, it provided the benefit of uh, having a diversified uh, source, so sources of electricity. So the vast hydropower uh, capacity of Norway uh, actually provides a, a, a very good uh, stabilizing or balancing uh, uh, factor um, for the vast wind resources of uh, Denmark, for example. I think Denmark uh, uh, was able to uh, get, I think about 60% of its electricity uh, about two years ago from uh, VREs, primarily wind. And they were able to do that because they are interconnected with, with Norway and the rest of Europe. So it's a working model. And existing uh, fossil fuel uh, facilities, primarily natural gas, uh, also play a role in this, uh, as we know, because of uh, they, they can serve as a, a very effective backup uh, for uh, VREs. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, one working model. And then of course, some parts of the US, there are also working models there. And then in the, east, uh, in the Eastern part of Australia where the main popula population and demand centers are located. So there are working models. And in India, they have uh, started working on this as well. So uh, it has been done. There's technology. It just requires regional cooperation and political will among governments. It's not a technology or economic challenge anymore. Because as, as we saw uh, in the slides that I presented, Solar and wind are now the cheapest sources of electricity in most regions and in most countries of the world. Thank you, Laf. Um, so Laf will be with us for about half an hour and he needs to rush back for another workshop. So please stop your questions here if you have any. So there is one more question, Laf. Um, so um, there are two questions, actually. The first one, is it possible that much of the install HP, um, does it mean hydropower, I'm sorry, in the Mekong will become standard assets? And the second question, who is more reliable government entities or private to supply energy from your experience? Uh, can, can, can you sorry. Uh... I didn't hear it well. Can you repeat the questions, please? Yeah, the first question is that, is it possible that much of the install HP in the Mekong will become standard assets? Um, ah, stranded. Yeah, standard, sorry. Yeah. Stranded, I think stranded. Standard. Um, and you can also quick click on Q&A box to see the question. And another question is who is more reliable government entities uh, to private or private to supply energy from your own experience? Uh, the first question uh, I think uh, uh, is uh, asking if the existing hydropower uh, uh, plants uh, in the Mekong can become stranded assets. Um, it is, of course, possible, but I don't believe it's realistic uh, to uh, envision that uh, they will become stranded assets and be phased out soon because uh, a, a large amount of investment have already been uh, uh, made on this existing hydropower 
and uh, unlike Europe, where there's a, move, a strong movement to actually uh, tear down uh, uh, the existing hydropower uh, dams, here in Asia, most of these hydropower uh, plants are relatively new. Uh, some of them are not even 10 years old. So, uh, and uh, since they are there, uh, we believe that they, 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 they can play a role. The existing ones, huh? we're not endorsing further expansion, especially in uh, uh, ecologically sensitive rivers like the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, and the Salwin in, in, in Myanmar. Those are just examples. So uh, they, 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 can, they, they can play a role. So we, I don't think uh, they should uh, become stranded assets. Uh, we should uh, optimize their, their use uh, and uh, by changing their role as uh, primarily as a, as a flexible uh, power plant that can provide backup power when there's no wind and when there's no sun, for example. Uh, and the second one is, uh, yeah. can you repeat the second? Um, yeah, so actually we have to move on to the next yeah. speaker. Okay. Um, yeah, um, sure. I, yeah, I will collect the questions again uh, after. Um, so um, yeah, like following um, after laugh, um, let's now go to Kao. Um, so Kao have like monitor dams in the Mekong River and also his research also focus on the political ecology of water and energy. Um, Kao, what is your take uh, about the law of um, hydropower dams in our region? You know, there are some questions that it's gonna be like um, a main um, alternative for clean energy. Uh, what do you think about this? And actually should we consider dams at all in our pursuit for clean energy? Really good question. Um, so I was really keen to join this uh, panel because you're asking the question, does clean energy mean more dams? Um, first of all, let me thank uh, colleagues at the Earth Journalism Network and also uh, especially Parita for inviting me to join today. Um, it's a real pleasure to join this panel. Um, so the focus of my intervention will address this kind of question of clean energy in the context of what's increasingly being discussed as the need for a just energy transition or a just energy transformation in the region. And, and I want to focus in particular on this kind of relatively new discourse of sustainable hydropower and ask, you know, does that mean that hydropower has become a clean energy that kind of fits in with just energy transition? Um, so to start answering that question, I think it's useful to begin by thinking about how controversy around hydropower has grown. Um, so actually critical attention to large dams in being a development project has grown since the 1970s. And this kind of reached a peak in the 1990s where one of the last projects that the World Bank funded at that time was the Pak Mun Dam in Northeast Thailand. And by that point of the early 1990s, overall the global hydropower industry and especially Northern countries industries were facing a growing crisis of legitimacy as they were being increasingly criticized as not actually contributing to development broadly defined. And so that led to the, um, to the initiation of what has now become well known as a multi-stakeholder process called the World Commission on Dams uh, that was convened in 1997. Uh, and it was actually co-convened by the World Bank and IUCN and published its findings in 2000. So it's a, a fairly hefty report with a lot of substantial research behind it. Um, to take one key paragraph from the conclusion, its main conclusion was that dams have made an important and significant contribution to human development and the benefits derived from them have been considerable. However, in too many cases, an unacceptable and often unnecessary price has been paid to secure those benefits, especially in social and environmental terms by people displaced, by communities downstream, by taxpayers, and by the natural environment. And then it goes on to make a fairly significant number of recommendations. And on the whole, um, many civil society groups in this region and around the world um, supported the recommendations of the report. 
but also at the same time, the hydropower industry and, and some governments with plans to build large dams were significantly less supportive. So then you know, this was the beginning of the emergence of a sustainable hydropower discourse as a kind of response to the WCD. Um, so the World Bank, for example, wanted to start financing hydropower again. And so it turned to the Nam Turn 2 project in Laos as an effort to establish a best practiced approach to hydropower. And in uh, more widely, the International Hydropower Association, which essentially is an industry lobby group, um, sought to counter the WCD, the World Commission on Dams, by introducing its own uh, sustainability guidelines and hydropower assessment protocol. And so it's kind of this combined significant effort of the hydropower industry and its supporters that has led to the sustainable hydropower discourse that we hear a lot about now in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, so I'll just briefly situate this in the context of Nam Turn 2. Um, so Nam Turn 2 was a pivotal moment for hydropower construction in this region and also globally, because I think it was the starting point of this discourse of sustainable hydropower that's now quite influential. Um, so I'm sure many of you know the project already. It was initiated in 2005 and commissioned in 2010. It's a public-private partnership project that is built in Laos but exports 90% of its power to Thailand. Um, and its key backers were the World Bank and the ADB and around 20 other uh, financial institutions. The key thing about Nam Ten Two was that hydropower try it was an effort to reframe hydropower. Rather than being infrastructure for electricity generation, hydropower became development projects. And so it included social and environmental dimensions. So there were a number of uh, social impacts of Nam Ten Two, including that around 6,200 indigenous people, mainly indigenous people, had to be resettled. And up to 100,000 people were affected downstream of the project on the Zabang Fai. So, you know, this, this project has been a very big discussion in the region, um, both during its design, implementation, and the consequences of it. In really brief summary, like the Namton 2 did provide better material infrastructure to those that have been resettled compared to past practices. And it also had more information disclosure and a kind of resource a revenue management framework for the um, for the Lao government over its 25 year concession. But it also didn't really fulfill its complete promise of a best practice project because there were many uh, questions over the long term livelihood viability of people that had been resettled and how the downstream impacts on communities had been in inadequately addressed as well as well as whether it had attained its conservation goals. But the reason I want to kind of mention this project is that that was the starting point of a claim that sustainable hydropower could exist in this region. It was kind of like a branding, a branding of hydropower, um, although it's obviously a very disputed claim. So from that starting point, the wider industry globally and in the region has sought to rebrand rebrand hydropower as being sustainable hydropower. And basically that has become equated with the concept of clean energy that's being discussed in this session. So just to kind of now jump forward to the very recent time, um, at the UNFCCC COP26 in Glasgow, and then again in uh, COP27 in Egypt, among the you know, many, there are many differences that were revealed, but one was the question, should hydropower be seen as a technology that contributes towards um, climate mitigation? Does it reduce greenhouse gases? So the International Hydropower Association was very present at the COP26 and it issued a statement that sustainable hydropower will play a key vital role in international efforts to address net zero emission targets by delivering clean and renewable backup energy um, that also supports growing wind and solar. But equally present were civil society groups with a lot of experience of the impacts on the ground and so they issued a statement endorsed by 340 organizations that essentially said that hydropower should be excluded from any UN climate finance mechanisms. And they cited a range of human rights and climate impacts that come from hydropower dams and also argued in favor of the benefits of healthy river, rivers and other energy options. So you know, this is just sort of one example of how the question clean energy and sustainable hydropower has been debated. In this region, uh, the Mekong River Commission has 
launched an initiative on sustainable hydropower since 2009. And then that led to the launch of a sustainable hydropower development strategy in 2021. So just, I mean, we, we could discuss in a lot of detail about what this means, but in a brief summary, a lot of the emphasis of this, the idea of sustainable hydropower is on technological fixes. So building fish passages, fish friendly turbines, sediment flushing, and so on. And probably the, the summary of this would be that these technical fixes may be an improvement on past approaches, but they still do not fully address the environmental and social impacts of large hydropower projects. Sustainable hydropower has also sought to address the public participation and impact assessment dimension of decision making around hydropower. But again, it's and maybe it's an improvement in some cases on past practices, but it's still essentially instrumentalized to attain project approval. And in the context of this region, it takes place within the context of limited civil and political and media freedoms, and often a lack of accountability between communities and the project developer and the state. So then to go to whether um, clean, because clean energy is often equated with dealing with the challenges of climate change. So this also is a, a key argument of the industry that sustainable hydropower is a mitigation technology. Um, there's been recent research conducted um, for the Mekong region and also other research in other tropical rivers that says that it can't really be assumed that all hydropower projects reduce greenhouse gas emissions significantly in the context of tropical regions. And there needs to be project specific studies to evaluate that claim. There's also been claimed, or it's often argued by the industry that large dams can contribute towards adaptation strategies meaning that projects will be managed at the times of extreme drought and flood to mitigate the impacts on communities. So again, in principle, that could be possible. But in practice, it's actually debatable whether we're actually seeing that being applied on the ground. And one of the key issues to take into account here is that many of the projects are actually operated either as by private, uh, private actors, by private companies, or as public-private partnerships. And these types of projects sign contracts that basically stipulate when they need to provide electricity and so companies are penalized if they do not meet their electricity supply obligations so in other words it's not actually clear that the the idea of a multi-purpose project that can also be good for climate adaptation is being internalized into the way that these projects are being designed and contracted in the region so i think actually a lot of this ultimately turns to the electricity planning process process that rafael has also been addressing and what, what, can, what I would say about sustainable hydropower is that it's a technology-centric discourse. It foregrounds hydropower as being the solution, and it actually draws attention away from the wider range of values that rivers provide, as well as the fact that there are other alternative potential solutions. And I think this is actually revealed in the planning process itself, where there has been a preference for large, large hydropower, even though, as Raphael has um, emphasized, there are other greenhouse gas and uh, reducing options available um, nowadays at, that are economically viable and at scale. This was also an important recommendation of the World Commission on Dams uh, to move decision making upstream, both in terms of strategic impact assessment and also considering the wider range of options around energy needs. So I think as a final point to conclude this um, intervention, what this, I think we need to shift our focus from debating sustainable hydropower to actually looking at the ways in which um, projects are being rationalized in the context of national and regional energy planning processes. So until the present, there's been a tendency to emphasize supply-led solutions, which obviously sell more electri electricity for the companies, rather than demand-led solutions, i.e. energy efficiency and demand-side management. And there's also been an emphasis on large scale projects over decentralized solutions, but perhaps very key. And I think this is also mentioned in the previous presentation. A lot of energy planning still now is expert led, including industry influenced rather than public interest led. Public interest led would mean more involvement of the role of civil society and the wider public. It doesn't mean that electricity supply is not a technical issue because it is. But underpinning the decisions around certain projects is not just technical answers. It's actually more about the values of the society, about what's important in terms of ecological and social justice, 
and also environmental sustainability. So I think this would be my, my final concluding remark, that in the context of a just energy transformation in the region, healthy rivers are a foundation of community and ecosystem resilience, as well as of social and ecological justice. And it's really important that that is better reflected into electricity policy and planning. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to share some ideas today. Thank you, Carl. Um, so there is one question um, from the audience. Um, I think you already added this, but perhaps you can elaborate it a little bit more. So um, the question is, what can we do to make um, hydropower dam more sustainable and less harmful? What can we do? <coughs> Sorry. What can we do to make hydropower more sustainable and less harmful? Um, I mean, there are the technical solutions that I've already discussed, but I think probably the important question is to ask why hydropower at all? So there are going to be contexts where there will be relatively lesser impacts of the state of hydropower that will partly depend upon agreements with community, including in terms of benefit sharing, as well as applying better technologies. But I think it's important to also reframe this discussion as not just being about better dams, but rather better energy or electricity planning in general, to ask where do the projects come from, rather than assume that a project is needed and then ask, how do we design it in a better way? I, I think this would here. Thank you, Carl. Um, I think it's time for us to move on to the next speaker. Um, we will get you back again in the final Q&A section. Thank you very much, Carl, for your input. So um, now let's now um, zoom into the energy landscape in the local community level. So we have Paul Kun here um, from Energy Lab. Um, so, Pokun, you have been working with civil society and startups in Cambodia to promote clean energy, um, and which look like an effective bottom-up process. Actually, Laf also discussed about this a little bit earlier. Um, so, what is your experience working with local payer, and what works and does not work? And do you think these local payers can offer solution for the region sustainable energy? So uh, it's now your turn, Paul Kuhn. Cool. Uh, thank you, Parita, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm also very excited uh, to be here to share some of the experience um, and some perspective, especially on the local communities that we have been um, kind of work uh, on a few projects together, uh, mainly actually we interacting with civil society organizations and that work directly with the community. And we also have a project that kind of work directly with startups. Um, I have a slide presentation I'd like to share. Um, so I'll be sharing that. Um, I think before we start uh, talking about the local community, I just wanna take a quick opportunity to kind of share what we do as Energy Lab uh, Cambodia, uh, who we are and what we do and how do we do those things. Um, so we are a, not an NGO, we are a nonprofit organizations that are, um, we receive several fundings from different donors and we've been operating in Cambodia it's actually very recent in 2018 and we're quite independent in a sense that we we'll work with everyone uh, to kind of work out uh, what are the plan for energy in Cambodia. And we we'll work with, uh, as mentioned, civil society organization, youth organization, we we'll work with private sector, we we'll work with NGO, we we'll work with governments. And we understand that there are high complexity in terms of understanding energy. Um, so only sharing information and kind of bridging the gaps of those skills can really help bring solving the issues. Um, that's why working with civil society organization is one of the key priority that we'll try to focus, kind of disseminating the information needed in energy space. Um, we're also trying to build kind of clean energy ecosystem. So looking at kind of policy and regulations to what are the key renewable energy growth that we can do in that space. 
And um, we also doing some, again, um, knowledge disseminations in terms of renewable energies, including solar and wind, and kind of looking into renewable energy skills as well. I think that we'll kind of touch upon a little bit earlier when we're talking about communicating with local community. And yeah, so that's just a brief summary of Energy Lab a little bit to kind of situate where we are doing in this space and what we're trying to achieve. Um, before I kind of jump into kind of local communities, what do they do? Um, give a quick context of what energy transition in Cambodia look like. So um, in 20, 2004, actually, Cambodia electricity grid was dominated by fossil fuels, so mainly uh, heavy fuels, oil, and diesel. But that was completely transformed in 2013 with a lot of hydro in the system. And um, But moving forward to 2030, um, Cambodia have a plan to increase a lot of uh, non-renewable energy sources to three-fourths of energy mix. So while of this is happening, um, Cambodia also have a plan with the global commitment uh, after COP26 and everything. Uh, government also committed to have a net zero by 2050. So having this kind of plan, very difficult to achieve the energy transitions in Cambodia right now. So that's kind of the context of what is energy look like in Cambodia. In terms of electrification rate, right now we um, achieve um, around 90, I'll say 99%. However, rich and zone doesn't mean uh, all those um, areas have um, reliable electricity to provide the community. Um, so there has been some works uh, that supported by uh, state-owned utility like EDC and some of the works from development partners to provide kind of last mile solution to those community. Um, so I'll just touch a little bit upon what are the opportunities looking into energy transitions. And I think Carl was talking a little bit about just energy transition is kind of another dimension of energy transition where we're not just talking about technolo technological shift in using technology from fossil fuels to um, renewable energy such as solar and wind, but we're talking about societal change and institutional change. For example, uh, if you're talking about fossil fuels, you might have like a big power coal plants that centralize the uh, power and then generating those power to the consumer. Um, with um, uh, this kind of new setup, for example, solar, you can install uh, you call solar rooftop on your household. So that might change some of the you know, way that consumer use electricity. So they, you know, and ideas of maybe not, not just consuming, but also selling electricity. Um, so that's just a little bit about how uh, energy transitions might look like. So in terms of uh, remote area, uh, there are some opportunities while we're working with CEO, try to addressing some of the priorities and what are the issues. Um, one of the things that come up uh, with the community and working with the remote area is um, people can really benefit from decentralized system. So we're talking about remote area that, you know, the grid, national grid network can never go to because um, it's so far away. So by having like alternative uh, renewable energy such as microgrid, for example, can really benefit to the community that have no access to energy. And we're talking about basic needs, you know, like light bulbs, uh, rice cooker, something like that can really benefit their day-to-day -day, uh, life. And I think in Cambodia right now, uh, there's an interest uh, in having like an active participation from the community to address the issues and needs. So looking at the human-centric approach by, you know, um, going to the community, um, doing probably some capacity building or raising awareness about these different types of technology for them to understand what are the needs at that community. Um, so not just to say, okay, microgrid work across Cambodia, but it's the questions of what are the project will needs for that community. So having active participations from the community is really important to ensure that there's a just energy transition in there. Um, and I think in that process, um, one of the things that come up is using that approach can really help addressing some of the gaps in uh, how they live there um, in the community, including poverty, inequality, and gender gaps. 
there's a lot of study has been done and a lot of paper I've been producing in, in terms of social energy transitions, looking at, you know, like uh, for the, you know, um, the projects, how that benefits to men more than women, for example. So really looking into that kind of niche as well. So that's a little bit about the local community that we've been kind of experienced working through with civil so, so society organization. Another part of group that we're working with is entrepreneurs. So looking at how entrepreneurs can integrate different types of solar technology to benefit their business, not business, but the innovation, innovative solution that they're trying to solve. For example, one of the programs that we're running at the moment at Energy Lab is called Switch to Solar. So we're working with different entrepreneurs um, in agri fishery sector to address, uh, so what are the types of solutions? How do you apply solar technology to benefit the society by using that technology? For example, solar water pumping technology that can you know, address some of the needs by using diesel to generate power, for example. And um, yeah, um, so I think um, uh, I would like to talk more, but I think I kind of run out of time. Uh, but that's kind of the whole pictures of some of the opportunities with locals and how are the roles that they can play in energy transition. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is just, uh, kind of uh, the program that I mentioned earlier, Switch to Solar. And I just want to touch upon a little bit on the cost uh, size of solar in Cambodia. Um, I think Kyle or Raft mentioned a bit earlier about the cost reductions of solar. In Cambodia, particularly, um, evidently back in 2017, our cost of solar is around 9.1 cent per kilowatt hour. Comparing to hydro or comparing to coal was not quite attractive at all. As of today, uh, we have a quite cheap solar uh, technology that can provide to customers um, at the community level or even to the entrepreneurs. So it's really a, a, an opportunity for them to look at, at the, this type of technology. Um, at the bigger picture, um, Cambodia have a lot of solar potential that we can untap um, at the moment. Uh, so I, I think according to the study, around 45,000 megawatt um, is the potential of solar in Cambodia. And we only can, at the moment, we only use around 50, uh, 500 megawatt and so. So there's a huge, huge potential in Cambodia for people to actually invest and look into this. Um, I think that's all I have. Um, if you would like to know more, um, uh, I have my in, info information here and uh, email. Uh, yeah, if have you have any more questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. Back to you, Parita. Thank you, Paul Kun. And actually, I have one question um, after listening to you. So I, I wonder, like, you know, that like, some debate about local communities limited capacity to adopt um clean energy technology or you know some say that they ha uh, have um, limited knowledge to do that and that's why we have to go back to centralize um energy projects um what do you think about this like um do actually like local communities can you know adopt the technology much better than we thought yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, from our experience, I think from hearing some case study from our partners, uh, community at the moment, they are learning actually to, you know, see what are the different options out there. Um, um, for example, if you live a, in a very far community where you have no access to transportation, it's, you know, long distance from where you can have access to resources, you have a think about what are the alternative things that you can do. And um, at the moment, as you, you know, may have, I think effect of all of us is the high price of diesel, high price of oil and coal and all of that. Um, and diesel, you know, um, so um, it, it's not uh, economical for them to run, for example, if they have like their small farm uh, at the community far away. Um, so having like someone to kind of share with them what are the alternative sources that can be economical for them to use, um, you know, that will be an opportunity. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's a step-by-step -step process where you 
can you share with the community what's out there and what are the like presenting the uh, technologies and kind of help them to have an ownership for themselves what is a part of the process too um, so yeah I hope I answer your question thank you um, and actually I have one more question about solar power um, so um, have you added like um, the issues like um, solar waste um, recycling option and so on is it like part of your job too yeah uh, it's one of the priorities that we will be looking at. Uh, that's a really good point. I think as more and more uh, adoptions of solar, not just we're not just talking about utility scale, we're talking about all the you know residential scales and uh, community scale. We need to look at like what are the recycling process. Um, it's one I don't have the answer to that, but it's one of the priority that Energy Lab will be looking into. So hopefully we can find someone that could um you know shed some lights on what are the um, case already that have been implementing in other countries or neighboring countries and how do they do that uh, but also like to learn from you know for example neighboring country like thailand vietnam now that they adopt more solar how do they uh, also thinking about recycling as well and this could be the final question for you um at the moment so um what does the finance of this decentralized system look like? Are there any barriers for attracting private investor or funding in these projects in Cambodia? Mm, um, I think um, there are some supports uh, from different development partners uh, looking into community projects. However, if someone say, I want to install solar, um, it depends on the supply, solar suppliers and how what are the financial structure they have to provide to the community. So they might they might say, I have a uh, you don't have to pay an upfront cost, you just need to pay monthly in terms of this and this and this. And different supplier may have different financial uh, structure for the customer as well. So I say it varies from one supplier to one suppliers. But on top of that, there are some support from the governments uh, at the community level looking at the last mile solution. Yeah. Thank you, Park Eun. Um, now let's uh, move on to the next speaker, um, Stefan. Um, so Stefan gonna zoom out a little bit, you know, um, outside the Mekong region to Southeast Asia and beyond. So Stefan, your research cover issues like energy transition and fossil fuel phase out. And I'm sure you have a lot to say about this. So um, what is the conversation about energy transition beyond the Mekong region? And just want to know like what should our region do to be a part of this you know, global effort to accelerate clean energy? So Stefan, the floor is you are now. Um, thank you very much. I'm trying to share my screen um, and I hope I will manage. Here it is. Um, if you could confirm kindly whether you can see my screen uh, and then I move on. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so my name is Stefan Bresner. I'm a research fellow uh, in um, the Stockholm Environment Institute in Bangkok, in our Bangkok office. And I will speak, as you mentioned, about just energy transitions a little bit beyond uh, Asia and give you also like, because there were some questions about, for instance, the European context. Um, just a brief glance at what the Stockholm Environment Institute is. We're a global research institute with more than 200 people working on many aspects of sustainable development uh, in Asia, in our Bangkok office, of course, course, we focus on Asian issues, but energy uh, transitions are just one aspect of our work. So we really work on many issues uh, um, uh, uh, related to sustainable development and low carbon pathways. Um, so there are, of course, uh, international challenges and international contexts to keep in mind. Um, for instance, um, the IPCC report speaks a clear language. If we want to meet uh, the targets and objectives of the Paris Agreement or the wider sustainability agenda, we have to do a lot, um, depending, of course, on the scenario, but like we have to talk about coal phase out, we have to talk about the share of electricity might need to increase actually uh, to meet uh, uh, a Paris Agreement 
and sustainability targets. Uh, to primary uh, energy from non-biomass uh, renewable energy sources has to increase significantly. And that's not I'm saying that, that's the IPCC saying that. And if you uh, direct your attention on the left here, this is specifically to Southeast Asia. This is the International Aid Energy Agency who have done some modeling. And here you can actually see the magnitude of what we are trying to achieve here. The green line here, the really curved line is the sustainable development scenario, which is in line with well below two degree scenarios. So uh, I think uh, we, uh, the world globally, but also the region has the work cut out if we want to meet um, sustainability targets. Um, I want to talk about briefly about changes that are needed in order to make the energy transition a success. So we'll be moving from a centralized fossil fuel based system to a smaller scale decentralized system based on low carbon energy. This implies changing the market structure and the infrastructure. Um, I think Raphael already alluded to this. It's of course also a, um, a change in our own behavior, uh, like the consumers have to play a more active role in energy transition and take ownership, so to speak. I think Carl also mentioned something uh, along these lines. And of course, this is a quite abstract picture and it's very important that energy transitions cater to local specificities and local needs. However, these kind of changes, I would argue, they have to be made everywhere, regardless in Europe, in Southeast Asia, in America. So there are some changes that need to be made without uh, forgetting the local context. Uh, what do we need as well for a successful energy transition? It's a lot of investment. Again, on the left, we have here the investment needed in Southeast Asia, again, based on an International Energy Agency scenario and expressed as part of the GDP on the right, you can see that Southeast Asia is already spending roughly 2% of GDP. And this part is to be increased if we want to meet uh, international sustainability targets. Um, but the good news is there are some studies done that for each dollar we spend, that there will be cost savings three to seven times uh, an order of magnitude. Think about reduced air pollution, for instance. Uh, thousands of people die around the world due to air pollution, especially from coal-fired power plants, for instance. This uh, saves some money, so to speak. Uh, savings from fossil fuel subsidies, for instance, uh, save us money. And uh, climate change mitigation, and like mitigating the most severe impacts of climate change also saves money. So if you do a cost-benefit analysis, it makes sense, actually, to invest in clean energy. Um, nevertheless, some challenges remain, especially in the Southeast Asian region here. After the COVID pandemic, I think it's uh, uh, public finances are, of course, strained. Uh, and then I want to touch upon something which Raphael alluded to as well. Um, the markets here are usually not set up for flexible decentralized energy, uh, renewable energy generation, meaning like we have like power monopolies sometimes, sometimes it's not very flexible, sometimes the power purchases agreements are negotiated in the long time, not in the short term. So there are some room for, room for improvements when it comes to market integration of renewables. Um, fossil fuels are an important source of revenue for some countries here. Think about coal in Indonesia or oil in Malaysia. So if we want to do an energy transition successfully, we have to think about some economic uh, uh, um, activities that can replace these revenues, for instance. Um, policy coherence is sometimes suboptimal, not only in the Southeast Asian region, but also in Europe, for instance, uh, speaking on um, the divergence of policies between the national level and the regional level, but also policy uh, in different sectors are not well aligned. Uh, so for instance, in Indonesia or in China, we see uh, um, uh, quite ambitious uh, emission reduction targets, but they exist simultaneously with um, an increase of coal-fired power. Some things uh, so are not well aligned uh, in terms of sustainability here. Uh, also the regulatory framework sometimes are not fit for purpose. If you want to build a renewable energy power plant, it might be more difficult in some countries than in others. Of course, fossil fuel subsidies still distort the market. Here on the left, we have a picture again from the World Bank uh, and a, quite a significant amount of GDP actually in the region goes to harmful fossil fuel subsidies. This part is unfortunately increasing again, especially uh, uh, after COVID. We heard a lot about investing in green technologies, investing better, building back better. There are studies who show actually no, uh, fossil fuel investments are still on the rise here. And of course, large hydropower projects are a risky bet in times of climate change. Um, but also there are opportunities when it comes to energy transitions. 
And here uh, I can give you some examples of Europe, and Raphael alluded to this as well, that renewables generate jobs. So in the EU, the renewable energy industry had a turnover of 163 billion dollars, uh, euros, I'm sorry, in 2020, 1.3 million people and continuing to increase work in the renewable energy sector at a time being. Um, renewables actually, they don't make the grid less stable, even though balancing costs increase, but there are methods and approaches to render the grid more stable, even with 100% renewables. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Denmark achieved for one day, I think 100% renewable uh, energy a couple of years back already, whilst maintaining grid stability. Energy efficiency, it's a huge oubli, a huge gap sometimes, not even not only here in the Southeast Asian region, but also in Europe. Sometimes we forget to talk about energy efficiency because the cheapest form of energy is the one actually not used. Um, and in the wake of the war in Ukraine, maybe homegrown energy, wind, solar might be better than important ones, especially when it's fossil fuel based. Uh, and renewable energy production due to its decentralized nature, nature actually offers some quite benefits uh, for people to bring people together, that people band together, invest collectively in renewable energy, and thus creating, so to speak, energy communities. Uh, again, we have some experiences in Germany where 50% or 50 plus percent of renewable installations are owned by the citizens themselves, for instance. And here on the left, and this was alluded to already, um, just a, a reminder that there's always a discrepancy between the forecasts of renewable energy, how much it will cost, and the actual cost reductions. And the Oxford Martin School has done a study where they reviewed, I think, 2,000 papers. And they looked, OK, what do the papers say about the cost estimates, the cost reduction, the foreseen cost reductions of renewable energy, of solar PV in particular? And the most optimistic study said, oh, it will be around 6% when actually it has been 15% of cost reduction. So we are continually underestimating renewable energy, and I think this has to be kept in mind. Now a question, why do we need uh, just energy transitions? Well, uh, it's quite simple. Uh, countries most impacted by climate change, like Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in the Southeast Asian region, are usually not the ones responsible for the majority of the emissions. These are still OECD countries. The private sector is not to be exonerated, because 50% of historic greenhouse gas emissions can be traced back to just 25 companies. And in the past, many people suffered from the negative effects of energy production without any say in, or any benefits accruing to them. Uh, so decisions were, were made on their behalf, but the benefits accrued somewhere else. And one of the most logic uh, conclusions I would say is if people are on board, if they support the energy transition, they will not oppose and we can move on quite quicker. Uh, in comparison to if people are not on board. Uh, in academia, we like to think uh, talk about uh, 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 transformative or, or just energy transitions and the concept of justice. We usually uh, uh, um, group these under four types of justices when we talk about energy transitions. It's a procedural justice, which means there is a variety of stakeholders who need to be brought on board civil society, private sector, public sector, and usually these decisions are only made by public and private sector and civil society is sometimes left out. We have to talk about distributional justice, the many shall benefit, not just the few as it is now. And I think renewable energies offer some interesting uh, aspects uh, and some interesting pathways on that. There's also recognition justice to be satisfied. Uh, we have to accept that there are many visions and we have to incorporate them and try to reach and build consensus. And there is also restorative justice and restore power, restore balance and restore the environment, especially in former uh, fossil fuel exploration sites, which are left untreated, which is really bad for the environment and the people living around there. Um, spotlight renewables, and I won't uh, go much into detail because many things have already said, had, had have been said. Of course, there are some positive aspects, but it depends also on who you ask. It depends also which kind of parameters you use, which kind of economic parameters, how do you price in the loss of fish, for instance, the loss of environmental services. But usually there are positives like lower electricity price, employment, meeting rising demand in a low carbon manner, storage capacity and flexibility. But there are also huge negative consequences. And we mentioned them, reduction in water availability, impact on people, impact on fish, on wetlands, reduction in nutrient and sediment loading, negative impacts on rice cultivation, loss of biodiversity and river fragmentation. So you can see that the negatives are quite severe and substantial. And so maybe, and I think this has been alluded as well before, 
And before we talk of adding new power, new capacity to the grid, maybe we should optimize the system we're already having. So the most important aspect would be to talk to stakeholders. Carl mentioned it, sit down with them, elaborate pathways with them. Uh, optimizing the existing system first, we talked about increasing market and infrastructure flexibility, a connection between countries, a connection between the grid. Of course, the ASEAN political integration is not well as well advanced as the European Union, for instance, but maybe um, um, coordinate more on a bilateral level at the first step would already help to use uh, resources more efficiently. So maybe regional or bilateral cooperation instead of large scale projects might be a good way forward in practice. And this is my last slide. And then uh, I will be open for questions, of course. Uh, there is this kind of uh, six bullet points of how to do good and just transition. It's really to sit down with impacted stakeholders talk about transition pathways, incorporate different visions, try to build a consensus here. The old regime, the centralized fossil fuel energy, of course, has to be replaced with clean and decentralized energy. This is only possible with market reform, which is somehow a little bit lacking uh, behind in some jurisdictions. Um, of course, adopt support policies, not only for the workers in the wider region, for economic diversification regions, for uh, reasons, for instance, but also adapt the regulatory framework so that renewables can really be built uh, quite uh, uh, quickly. Of course, I mentioned it before, economic diversification is really key in re regions dependent on fossil fuel revenues. Education and training to provide people with the needed skills to weather the negative externalities of energy transitions, for instance, is needed. And of course, a cleanup of old fossil fuel development sites is also needed. So if we respect this, we are moving much closer to a, a just transition vision, so to speak. Uh, but in the meantime, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, 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 take questions now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stefan, um, for taking us out from the Mekong region and see that we also share the same story about um, transparency, civil society movement and so on. Um, so it there is one agreement um, in the chat, chat box actually. Um, so the audience um, agree that um, you know some project, some energy projects are efficiency um, and um, really improve national and regional um, economic in the long run, despite you know its um, low transparency. So how how would you what did you take on this? You know. Well, this is actually uh, uh, something I, I forgot to mention, um, but this is actually uh, like when I talk about good policies, like transparency has to play a huge role because and I think Carl mentioned this as well, that like people increasingly want to know where not only their money is going, but like what projects are going to be built, who is benefiting from energy projects, for instance. And we have seen this in several countries that sometimes the benefits of even of fossil fuel production, for instance, Indonesia, as an example, which comes to mind, they usually don't accrue to the people on the ground, but to rich uh, um, um, monopolies, for instance. And there's little, very little transparency of actually where the money from the revenues go. And the revenues are substantial, but sometimes they don't trickle down to the people on the ground and to the people who have sometimes to suffer the negative consequences. So I think transparency is a huge, huge uh, 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 part of the equation here. Uh, how to strengthen a transparency. I think like civil society, what they're increasingly doing is building coalition demand transparency, being vocal about that. But then again, it's also like the policymakers themselves who have to agree to like, yeah, lay open the account accounts and stuff like this. And it's always very easy to argue for more transparency here in the seminar, but I guess it's very challenging. Uh, but I think it's a really important uh, part of the equation. And yeah, as soon as civil society continues to push for it, I think then we might see some progress. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I think we can now open for like um, the final Q and A section. Um, so um, we have like allow ten minutes um, to do that. Um, so actually, um, back to Carl. Do you wanna? Do you uh, have any idea um, for the question that I just asked Stefan? I think that's quite interesting. You know, to talk about <clears throat> efficiency and transparency. Could I, there's a couple of other questions in the chat box. Is it okay if I take them up? Yeah, sure, sure. Great, thanks. So, I mean, I, I'm gonna briefly summarize them. There's a really interesting question on demand or need. Um, 
So I'm not sure I'm going to answer it directly, but it actually raises a question that I often also have myself. Um, so one, there's always an assumption that energy, energy demand will keep on growing and therefore energy supply will be required to meet that new demand. And I think both Stefan and Raphael have already um, mentioned that, well, one way of addressing rising demand is actually by not building new capacity, but actually instead investing in energy efficiency and demand side management. Um, there are some approaches. So one, one of the points that I think, well, at least one of the one of my understandings on this is that, well, actually energy efficiency doesn't necessarily make money for energy companies. Um, so in that sense, it's not a good investment opportunity, even if it's actually good for the public interest of the operation of an energy system. Um, there are also uh, approaches to energy management where what are termed energy service companies can bid for new generation demand within a power development plan. And then actually, rather than building a new power station, use use their uh, what they're contracted in terms of the funding to invest into energy efficiency measures and demand side management within the existing <coughs> sorry energy um, use. So that's kind of a market-based solution to energy efficiency. But also what I think is a really interesting question about demand, which is maybe more my political science interest, is that demand is also partly socially produced. You know, we, we rarely if ever ask the question, demand, uh, demand by who? You know, I think there's a qualitative difference between demand of electricity for energy intensive industries and demand coming from meeting basic needs. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so this is an energy justice question, actually. <coughs> and we, we could actually also then ask questions about, well, what types of industries are being prioritized in the wider economic planning that require energy? Because it is quite possible that a number of the large projects that are being built are really for quite concentrated benefits of the relative few rather than a larger number of the population. Um, the second question that I wanted to briefly address is there's a really interesting uh, comment about uh, the SWIFT Development Corporation collaborating with the Mekong River Commission. <coughs> and they're both developing uh, new guidelines or actually have in the case of the MRC. So I think this, this fits within the sustainable hydropower paradigm. And it's not that I would challenge it directly in, in the sense that, well, you know, best practice could improve existing projects and potentially future projects. But I think what, what's really important to recognize is that best practice on paper may not translate into best practice as applied on the ground in the context of this region. And, and something that I wanted to actually add to this is there's almost no studies, especially institutional studies, about whether past proposed environmental impact assessments and environmental management plans have actually been implemented as planned and whether they've been successful or not. So in other words, there's quite a lot of effort to continually create new best practices, but there's never really been a, a thorough assessment of, well, what, what, is, what has been the outcome of the previous ways in which EIAs and SIAs have been implemented in projects? Like, why were, why were they or why were they not taken up? And what could we learn from that? Um, so I mean, maybe, there, maybe there are studies I'm not aware of, but I think it's actually quite crucial to also learn from the past in the context of this region rather than also just connect to international best practice. Um, the third, the third uh, comment I wanted to briefly meant were, uh, address was, I think also from Andrew about um, why, um, why a sediment and wild capture fisher is not valued. Um, so my suspicion on this is that they're not costed and fully internalized into the way in which power sector planning is conducted at present. There's quite a significant siloization between water governance and water management and energy planning. So energy planning is primarily around optimizing the economic efficiency of the electricity system and grid and the way in which social and environmental impacts are kind of internalized into that is through mainly more regulatory measures of has there been an EIA conducted, has there been an SIA, SIA conducted, if it's a transboundary project was the Mekong River Commission's uh, procedures for notification uh, and agreement, the PMPCA also conducted or not. But again, that, that doesn't translate into the question, 
are those measures actually implemented on the ground and are they actually successful? So I think recently there's been a new um, study from the MRC asking those questions on the technologies of sediment movement and fish, pass uh, fish passages for the Zyberi and Don Sahong at a very early stage. And I think it's a study to watch closely. Um, but I, again, so I think the, the answer to this question is partly in way, the way in which planning is fragmented uh, rather than holistically undertaken. Thank you, Carl. And Stefan, um, do you want to add this the question on um, demand that Carl just um, talked about? And there's also another direct, qu direct question for you about circular economic principle. Like, could you share the circular economy apply or explanation for renewable energy security? Yes, so and there's also one question. Uh, let me try to uh, take up many, some points that, uh, that, that Carl was making. And there's because there's one question uh, about like, how do we address this kind of suboptimal policy framework that like at the same time, there's emissions reduction targets, but at the same time, coal fire power plants are built. And I think Carl mentioned was something really important that of course, we can look to other jurisdictions, to other countries and learn, but sometimes there might be some solutions on the ground from the people uh, already there in front of our eyes locally. Yes, that's completely true. Uh, but however, I can speak only uh, from, from my two experiences. One is more in Europe and one is actually in Indonesia. So in, 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 in Europe, in Germany, um, when they decide on coal phase out, they founded what they called a coal phase out commission. And so experts, academics, civil society representatives and politicians sat together on one table and discussed problems and issues and elaborated on the pathway. So these kind of commissions could be some way forward in order to address this kind of policy incoherence to bring the different levels into one table and discuss simply and analyze, okay, where is some incoherence between the policy levels? This is like the example of Germany, for instance. But then once we had a workshop in Indonesia and actually, and this is a quite a creative approach and I have not done research on that and I don't know how, how it will be successful, but actually uh, during the COVID pandemic, um, uh, several uh, COVID commissions were formed, for instance. And in the region, especially in Indonesia, they were assessed for doing actually a great job, good work in coordinating all the ministries in their response towards the COVID pandemic. So maybe if we want to have a successful energy transition, we could implement this kind of energy transition task force, which helps to coordinate between the ministries on the regional and national level. So this might be one uh, uh, aspect, one uh, approach, how to bring the levels a little bit closer together. Um, demand side management, yes, is a big problem. And um, sometimes uh, uh, energy companies don't make money in uh, uh, energy which we don't consume. Again, the policy sphere has to step in there and make regulations uh, in order like to uh, refurbish buildings, in order to sell, for instance, at the, on the market, you can only sell energy, efficiency, uh, energy efficient product, for instance, that would be one approach. And for the circle economy principle, I'm not so sure I'm understanding the question. However, um, from a European perspective, again, Again, uh, under quotation marks, be mindful that the European context can't be transferred 100% to the Southeast Asian context. But this is what Raphael alluded to before, actually, because in Europe they have a completely integrated electricity system where even like uh, um, two different countries share the same bidding zone, meaning electricity can be sold uh, uh, and, and consumed uh, between two countries quite effortlessly. Uh, this increases uh, security because uh, it's always leveled against renewable energies. Oh, the wind and uh, doesn't blow uh, all the time and the sun doesn't shine. Of course, there's storage, but there's also an integration because in some point, in some countries or in some parts of one large region, wind blows all the time and sun is shining. And this is what Raphael, I think, mentioned uh, that sometimes Norwegian uh, uh, hydropower, for instance, can come to the rescue if, I don't know, the, the north of Germany is clouded and in Spain, sun is not shining because it's raining. So the more you integrate electricity systems, of course, there are costs and other uh, risks, but the more you integrate, the more you spread out the risk, the more stable the grid becomes. So maybe this is Rapunz, uh, how this feeds into the circular economy, I'm not sure about this question, but at least I hope I address the security aspect of renewable energy deployment. I thank you very much. Thank you. So actually we are nearly running out of time. Um, do you have any points that um, you want to address before we end this webinar um, for both of you, Carl and Stefan? 
I think probably in the interest of time, I've, I've addressed most of the points that I think I can do in the questions. Thanks. Okay. Yes, same here. I think it's, uh, yeah, we have to talk, we have to talk to each other, find consensus and not deciding over the head of pe heads of people is already a good first step, I guess, that would be one of the main takeaways. And thank you very much for having me. And thank, thank you also you. to the panelists for sharing the knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I also would like to thank you all speakers too. Um, love um, Carl, Paul Kuhn and Stefan too for being with us today um, and for giving us a lot of output that um, really boosts our knowledge of the medical energy and also thank the audience for being with us um, today and um, after this webinar we will send you the online survey um, for us to gather the feedback and ideas on the topic for the next webinar series and um, it will take you no more than five minutes um, for doing the survey I promise and if you wish to continue your conversation with the speaker you can contact the EJN for their emails they are open for further discussion with you all and um, I think that's all for today and thank you and see you in the next webinar Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.